This episode is brought to you by ResumeWriting.com. For more than 15 years, the network of independently certified professional resume writers at ResumeWriting.com have helped hundreds of thousands of people land better jobs. Before starting your job search, go have them get you ready at www.resumewriting.com. Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Sorry that this episode is just a bit late, but, well, it kind of got away from me a bit. Uh, Maybe I bit off a few too many topics for one episode, but this is Chapter 5, Part 2, Wired, Slate, Salon, Suck.com, let's just say more mature media web plays. We've been looking at media's response to the arrival of the internet and the web, and thus far we've looked at a couple of high-profile examples that were pioneering, but ultimately not long-lasting. So in this episode, I want to take a look at the early web media plays that have survived, or have had a greater influence over the long haul. For example, in the first part of this chapter, we looked at the Mercury Center, and its abortive attempts to keep the newspaper industry out in front of the web revolution. But again, newspapers were some of the first entities to embrace online experimentation, and they have been responsible for some innovations that they deserve credit for. Possibly the most successful online newspaper play has been the Wall Street Journal. Prototype online experiments began at the Journal in 1993, And the original plan was to do a sort of proprietary service with their own software that users could dial in for. But by 1994, the web was taking off, and as the proprietary software was still another year away, the project was quickly shifted to the web and to HTML. In July of 1994, the journal launched the money and investing update at update.wsj.com. It was a simple two-column site with market data in the right-hand column and a what's news column that was updated throughout the day on the left. The Wall Street Journal Interactive Edition was launched in April 1996 and for the first time included the full contents of the print edition of the journal as well as significant amounts of Dow Jones Newswire content. The Interactive Edition launched with a full paywall and was popular and profitable from very early on. Lots of people hold up the success of the journal's paywall as a possible model for other newspapers, but even the Wall Street Journal itself will tell you that it publishes some specialized content and data that a very specific audience is willing to pay top dollar for. The model probably does not work as well for general news, which has become a bit of a commodity. More on that in a bit. By the way, Neil Buddy, who was kind enough to speak with me about this bit of Wall Street Journal history, took pains to give credit to none other than Walt Mossberg for being a key agitator, encouraging management of the journal to move online early and quickly. Walt has obviously been an early adopter for a long time. The New York Times experimented similarly with an online service known as Pulse, in the late 1980s, but truly entered the digital era in June of 1994 with its presence on AOL called At Times. Like so many others, the Times got its feet wet via a partnership with an online service, but the partnership was limited because for contractual reasons, something to do with a Nexus-Lexus contract, the Times could largely only publish content related to arts and entertainment, not actually breaking news. The New York Times first experimented with the web in October 1995 with a special report about Pope John Paul II's visit to New York City. When the Times went fully onto the web, 
it went full bore when in the evening of January 19th, 1996 at nytimes.com, the exact same URL it has today, the New York Times published the full content of the next morning's, January the 20th, paper in full. More than almost any other entity, the Times has embraced the archival powers of the web. You can now search Times articles going back to 1851, more than 13 million articles in total. And with their Times Machine feature, you can even search digital reproductions of the actual Times' printed pages going back 129 years. My thanks, by the way, to Rich Meislin of the New York Times, an early advocate for the Times going digital, for providing me with this background. If you go to the webpage for this show, you can see rare screen caps of what the Times look like on AOL, as well as an early nytimes.com homepage, which Rich was also kind enough to provide us. But as interesting as the successes of major brands like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times are, I'm equally fascinated by entities and people who have found web success that you might not have expected. Plenty of early successful web plays came from unexpected corners of the media landscape. I'm thinking, for example, of efforts like those of E! Online. You wouldn't imagine that the cable network E! Entertainment Television would be a web pioneer, but in fact it has been. Early on, E! threw a lot of resources behind an online portal, eonline.com, which in many ways presaged blogging and the celeb and gossip sites that we're familiar with today. It did this as a joint venture with CNET, which we'll get into again in a little bit, but eOnline showed what could happen if a media brand trusted the native capabilities of the online world and respected online users and behaviors. Another example along these lines of an unusual traditional media success comes from the Weather Channel. The Weather Channel itself is a unique and fascinating entrepreneurial story overall. Throughout its history, the Weather Channel has succeeded despite the naysayers who have scoffed at the need for an entire channel devoted to the weather. You can obviously get weather info anywhere, of course. It's an information commodity. And yet, just as the Weather Channel believed it could build a successful brand around the weather on television, it has also succeeded in doing so on the web. In the early 1990s, a Weather Channel employee registered the domain names weather.com and travel.com. The Travel Channel was at that point a corporate sister site. The first iteration of weather.com was launched in April of 1995 spearheaded by a young project manager named Kathy Daly. It seemed like a modest compliment to the existing Weather Channel partnerships, such as the ones that it had recently launched with CompuServe and other online services. But then Daly's boss, Deborah Wilson, got word that Wired Magazine's new website, Hotwired, was shopping around advertisements and asking for a $150 CPM rate. On cable, the Weather Channel was used to getting $5 CPMs. Wilson later said, quote, I remember when Hotwired made that announcement. I photocopied and distributed it. Finally, an industry was starting to happen. End quote. So, leveraging its existing sales force, Weather.com started to run ads itself, with the first one sold to Chemical Bank. The champion of Weather.com's evolution within the company was the son of the Weather Channel founder, Frank Batten. Frank Batten Jr. was a web convert. He could see the web would be big, and he saw that the Weather Channel could plant its flag there before anyone else. And so in a meeting with Wilson and Daly, the two women were told by Batten Jr. to double down on their online efforts, quote, we don't think you're thinking aggressively enough about what this could be. Who knows what weather.com could be, but it's clear it at least has the potential to become something very important. You really need more resources than this, and you need to run like heck, end quote. Now, that's a media brand embracing the web. 
Weather.com was soon fully integrated into all of the Weather Channel's operations. By 1998, only three years after its launch, Weather.com was logging 150 million page views monthly. Today, it logs 13 billion page views, an average of 54 million unique visitors each month, and generates untold millions in revenue for its parent company. Weather.com is routinely in the top 30 of the most traffic websites in the world, ahead of Yelp, the New York Times, and even the most popular porn site. It has even transitioned into the modern era with one of the most popular mobile web apps in the world, and a website that is heavy on community and social content. Or you could take this as another fascinating early internet success that most people don't know about. Did you know that Reuters, the news agency, was actually one of the biggest winners of the entire dot-com era? We were just speaking about the Wall Street Journal and the commoditization of news content in general. Well, in large part, I think you can thank or blame Reuters for that fact, for news becoming a commodity on the web. In fact, I would posit that the very fact that the news industry has been so disrupted by the web can largely be laid at Reuters' doorstep. Let me explain why. Remember in our chapter on Yahoo, when we discussed how sites like Yahoo and Excite and the other early web portals turned themselves into portals piece by piece, a step at a time, by adding new useful items to keep users coming back. Now they would give you weather, now they'd give you sports scores, and then email and calendars, etc. Well, all that started off with news, with headlines. And Reuters was the driving force behind that. We need to step back a little bit here for a quick history lesson. You know about newswire agencies, right? Like the Associated Press. They were set up in the 1800s after the birth of the Telegraph. Sensible newspapers, looking to cut costs, decided that pooling their reporting efforts would be cheaper and easier than each paper sending out its own reporter around the world to gather stories, especially now that the Telegraph could deliver stories nearly instantaneously. The AP was set up in 1848 as a consortium of New York City newspapers to do just that. This ensured that no one newspaper could get the scoop over another, and so the AP was controlled collectively by all the member newspapers, and eventually broadcasters, and eventually numbered in the thousands. The AP dominated news delivery in the 20th century, but remember it was, and is, a non-profit entity. Reuters, in contrast, was founded a few years after the Associated Press, also in the 19th century, but in a crucial difference, Reuters is a for-profit company. And Reuters was European-based. The AP was always bigger, with tens of thousands of news entities as members, and along with a smaller player, the United Press International, the AP tended to dominate the North American market. Reuters was largely and also ran in North America. So, in the early 1990s, Reuters as a company was looking for a way to get a larger share of the North American market. Its method for breaking in was to leverage new media. Starting in 1991, the Reuters New Media Division began signing deals to provide news headlines and articles to the early online services like Prodigy and CompuServe. Newspapers were somewhat hostile to the online services in general because they saw them as direct competition. And thus the Associated Press was hostile as well, owned as it was by newspapers. But Reuters was more than happy to play ball with the online services since, again, it was looking to build its North American business. So here was a tiny but unexploited market niche that could be used to wedge Reuters' way into contention. And they were very successful. By 1993, online sales represented 10% of Reuters' growing U.S. operations. This friendliness to new media continued right up through the arrival of web portals like Yahoo. 
Again, Reuters was willing and eager to do deals with any new website or portal that wanted to offer headlines. If you'll also recall from that Yahoo chapter, Reuters was willing to experiment and do deals with Yahoo, agreeing to take a share of advertising revenue. By the year 2000, some 60% of the revenue for the American unit at Reuters came from its more than 900 web clients. But more than that, Reuters was willing to invest in their web partners, or even to take equity stakes in lieu of cash sometimes. Reuters paid $3 million, if you'll remember, for a 4% stake in Yahoo, and that investment turned out fabulously. But Reuters also took stakes in companies like Infoseek, VeriSign, Sportsline, Digimark, and US Web. They ended up making a killing during the dot-com years. Reuters' willingness to work with online and web players changed how news operates in our modern world. First through services like AOL and Prodigy, Americans started to expect that news headlines were something they could get almost anywhere, even while they were checking their email. The struggles of big media brands like Time, Newsweek, and the New York Times, or even CNN for that matter, to find relevancy on the web is due in no small part to the fact that people got accustomed to getting their news, their sports scores, and stock quotes by logging on to, say, their Yahoo account, not by paying for a newspaper subscription. Heck, most users must have assumed that Yahoo had a newsroom somewhere. Online news became a commodity, and that's largely thanks to Reuters as an accident of history trying to gain traction in a new market, one upstart company being more willing to experiment with online companies than others were. The AP didn't actually start selling news to websites until 1996, and even then, only to existing AP members for use on their websites. Of course, the revenue model of newspapers was decimated by other factors, Craigslist, eBay, and largely the loss of the classified advertising monopoly that the newspaper industry had enjoyed for so long, but I'm arguing that it is also the commodification of news on the web that has them fighting for relevancy to this very day. But maybe the most interesting stories to me are those sites that were web natives from the very beginning, that created themselves almost wholly of and for this new medium, the web. Names like CNET, Salon, Slate, Suck.com, and even Wired. ZDNet is probably the granddaddy of these names. ZDNet was actually founded in April of 1991 as a subscription-based umbrella online service for all of Ziff Davis's computer-related content. Ziff Davis is a publisher of magazines and other content, today probably most known to a listener of this podcast for its IGN network of video game websites and content. But at the time, Ziff Davis was best known as the publisher of PC Magazine, which in the mid-90s was ringing up upwards of $300 million in advertising revenue all by itself. ZDNet evolved from a standalone online service through a period of partnerships with the larger online services like CompuServe, Prodigy, and MSN, and at one point could boast 300,000 subscribers online. But in early 1995, it launched as a web property, and by June of that year could boast 2.5 million page views per week. Another name we probably know better today is CNET. Interestingly enough, CNET began its life as a cable television startup of sorts. CNET was founded in 1992 by a then 27-year-old dynamo named Halsey Miner. Miner came from Wall Street, joining Merrill Lynch in 1987, the year of the then-famous stock market crash, and Miner made his name at Merrill Lynch by helping the company create what we would now call a corporate intranet, but which at the time was just a revolutionary wiring together of the company's computers so that they could talk to each other in real time. He also worked on another early networking and data-related project with 
another young Merrill Lynch employee by the name of Jeff Bezos, who would later laud Miner as, quote, somebody who is really very alert to the technology marketplace and peering ahead into the future. He is an incredibly engaging visionary, end quote. A couple of years before Bezos, too, would leave Wall Street to become an online entrepreneur, Halsey Miner left Wall Street with a dream to create a cable channel revolving around computers and technology. In the 500-channel information superhighway world being promised in 1992, Miner believed that he could create a sort of MTV for the computer generation. In a way, Miner had his eye on things like Ziff Davis's PC Magazine and ZDNet, because at the time, technology magazines like PC Magazine and PC World were capturing almost 80% of the computer industry's approximately $3 billion a year in advertising spend. Computer companies simply did not advertise much on TV in those days, and so if Miner could create a cable channel that would cater to their needs there were obviously riches to be won. The motto that Miner came up with for his new cable channel was something along the lines of, it's not just a television network, it's networked television. Miner raised money for his channel from the usual angel investors, as well as from Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen. We saw Paul Allen in the AOL chapter when he invested in, and then eventually tried to take over, America Online. In the 1990s, Allen was a prominent investor in such ventures as Ticketmaster, Egghead Software, and the movie studio DreamWorks. So CNET was right in his investing wheelhouse. CNET also received an investment from the USA Network, which agreed to air CNET's first television shows on its channels, USA and the Sci-Fi Channel, as the fledgling CNET started to gear up for a full roster of programming. In 1994 and 1995, CNET debuted its first shows, CNET Central, with former MTV VJ and later godfather of podcasting Adam Curry, and another show called The New Edge, Both these shows focused on tech, computers, and even the fledgling online scene. One CNET executive described CNET Central as, quote, the entertainment tonight of the digital world, end quote. None other than Ryan Seacrest got his first start in the television business as the host of The New Edge, as well as doing various voiceover clips for CNET shows. But all of this was, of course, happening right when the web was taking off. And so Miner decided that CNET needed to jump into the web as well. CNET Online launched in June of 1995 and on its first day could claim 115,000 page views. Within months, it was one of the top sites on the web in terms of traffic. And Halsey Miner's greater evolving vision for CNET soon became some sort of a conglomeration of television programs and websites working synergistically to break news, offer up product reviews, and provide a platform for fan discussion. But the success of the web efforts, coming as they did in 1995 and 1996, as the dot-com era was beginning in earnest, soon began to take over CNET's larger mission. CNET would embrace the web, and especially web advertising, with a greater gusto than most other entities at the time. When Hotwired launched with the first banner ads in 1994, again, more on them in a little bit, CNET embraced web advertising with gusto. CNET began aggressively selling online advertising space, sometimes bundled with advertising on its television shows, and sometimes not, at the astronomical CPM rate of $100 per thousand. It soon became one of the biggest deliverers of online advertising inventory, behind only Netscape, Yahoo, and Excite. CNET could achieve this because it was also aggressively pushing the advertising paradigm forward in new and interesting ways. CNET was among the first to embrace ad targeting based on a web surfer's demographic and location information. 
And CNET was also among the first to make use of its own server log files to analyze which pieces of content were more popular than others, and thus which articles or posts were able to deliver more advertising inventory, and then to make editorial decisions based on this real-time data. Today, there is much debate about the advertising and content Chinese wall with sites like BuzzFeed and others, so-called clickbait sites, tailoring content on the fly to attract more shares, likes, and eyeballs. CNET was one of the first to wade into these waters. CNET would go on to build out an entire web and television empire, including the launch of sites like Download.com, News.com, as well as the joint venture we mentioned with E! Entertainment that would create E! Online, but also Snap.com, which would be a key component eventually of NBC's failed NBCI web strategy. CNET rode the dot-com wave to great success, IPOing as early as 1996. CNET would eventually not only acquire its erstwhile competitor ZDNet, but ultimately all of Ziff Davis Media in October of 2000 for approximately $1.6 billion. This enabled CNET to claim to be the eighth largest internet property by the year 2000, according to Media Metrics. CNET itself would be purchased by CBS for about $1.8 billion in 2008. Now, as you can see, both ZDNet and CNET, though they had varying properties in various mediums, were largely evolving to become modern publications on the web as we might understand them today. They were not yet blogs, as we understand those today, but they were beginning to move to the 24-7 publication schedule we are now familiar with. And as we saw in part one of this chapter, there were a lot of people who thought that that was precisely what the web was destined to be, a new type of publishing medium. Remember when the magazine folk at Time Warner looked at the web, they saw magazine publishing, but for the digital age. And frankly, as we've seen with things like page views and CPM rates, as well as columns and ad channels, this was not exactly an insane thing to think at the time. So what about just doing a magazine on the web? What about creating a web-native publication? If this was the logical extension of media at the time, why not experiment with, and this is a term that makes my skin crawl now, but it was popular at the time, why not create a webzine? Well, lots of people did this in lots of different markets and interest niches. After all, there were media people who looked at the web and imagined all the fixed costs of paper and ink and delivery infrastructure suddenly going away all at once, and they salivated. There were dozens, perhaps hundreds, of small-scale attempts to create web-only publications, some of which were quite successful in their own ways. And there were great pioneering e-zines who straddled the new world of the web and then the early 90s world of printed zines. I'm thinking of sites like Feed and Word magazine, most of these sites are completely down the memory hole at this point, however. They were such early web pioneers and so relatively small in comparison to sites like Mighty Pathfinder that there's basically no hope of any archives existing. But then again, there are barely archives of Pathfinder in existence, and that was a top 10 website at one point. But one of these pioneering web-native publications is still very much with us today, and that is Salon.com. Salon was the brainchild of David Talbot, who in 1994 was the arts and ideas editor at the San Francisco Examiner. Talbot had an entrepreneurial streak and wanted to start his own publication. When he was unable to round up investors for a traditional print magazine, he eventually took $60,000 in seed money from an unlikely source. Apple. At the time, Apple was planning to launch its own branded competitor to America Online, which it dubbed eWorld, and so it was looking for content partners. eWorld ended up going nowhere, but 
Talbot had rounded up a crew of other journalists from the Examiner and other San Francisco area titles with Apple's money and had gotten hooked on the idea of a digital publication with its promises of cheaper and more nimble business models. A $2 million investment from Adobe Ventures saved the initiative, and on November 20th, 1995, Salon published its first issue on the web. It didn't publish on Salon.com, however, because a hair salon owner in Texas owned the domain Salon.com. So Salon was originally published under the domain Salon1999.com. The hair salon owner was eventually encouraged to part with Salon.com for a significant amount of Salon stock. Salon had been chosen as the name because, in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way, the publication aspired to be a sort of Algonquin roundtable for the web era. There were eventually true journalists and actual news bureaus, but Salon has always leaned heavily on criticism, on reviews and essays. Again, closer to what we would now think of as a modern blogging operation, but At various times, Salon has published a wide range of musings and think pieces from everyone from Andrew Sullivan to Camille Paglia. The second editor of its Media Circus column, which covered the media industry, was a young writer named Dave Eggers. Salon actually launched as a bi-weekly publication, eventually moving to weekly, and Salon's first issue focused on what else? the OJ trial. And there's another parallel to what we learned about in part one of this chapter with Pathfinder. As Linda McCutcheon told us, Princess Diana's death was a major milestone for online news and media sites. And indeed, the Princess Diana story was a milestone that proved to change Salon's focus. In the immediate wake of the accident, Salon found that people were browsing online with an almost insatiable hunger for any new details, for analysis and punditry, a hunger that Salon found it could quench. Salon soon moved to a daily publishing schedule, but it also hit upon the model so many web publications seem to have settled on today. Occasionally, breaking news is great, And Salon has broken quite a bit of news over the years, beginning with the revelations about Henry Hyde's extramarital affairs during the Clinton impeachment scandal. But it is analysis and essays that has become Salon's bread and butter. What Salon writer Gary Kamia has called a, quote, second-day story approach, end quote. For just this reason, another major event for Salon was the contested Clinton-Gore election of 2000, where hourly pieces reading the tea leaves and parsing the responses from the campaigns was supplemented in Salon with actual on-the-ground reporting from a young Salon staffer by the name of Jay Tapper, who you might recognize today from CNN. Salon was successful enough to have its own IPO in 1999, but then again, who didn't have an IPO in 1999? In truth, Salon has always struggled throughout its existence to turn a profit. It has famously experimented with all manner of paywalls over the years, with varying degrees of success. It has run into the catch-22 that most web publications have had to wrestle with over the years. It's hard to get enough people to pay for content to make it pay the bills. And if your content is behind a paywall, then there's no way to attract enough page views or eyeballs to keep advertisers happy. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Another early magazine come website that struggled with this philosophical and economic issue of paywall versus eyeballs was Slate.com. In 1995, Michael Kinsley was one of the most famous names in the media world. He was formerly the editor of Harper's Magazine, as well as The New Republic. He was nationally known as the co-host of the CNN show Crossfire, which you'll remember Jon Stewart famously shamed out of existence a few years ago. But like David Talbot, at age 45, Michael Kinsley wanted a change, 
and he too was itching to start his own magazine. Just like David Talbot, the logic of experimenting with an electronic magazine seduced Kinsley. In September of 1995, he saw in a Newsweek article that Microsoft was looking for a big-name editor to head up a news division. This was right after Microsoft got the internet, of course. And part of the new internet strategy at Microsoft was to produce content for the new medium as much as it was to control the platform of the web by burying Netscape. As Business Week put it, quote, Bill Gates may turn out to be the Walt Disney of the web, end quote. For a while, in fact, there were dozens upon dozens of Microsoft content plays, not the least of which was MSNBC, which would actually end up launching at the exact same time as Sleep. So Kinsley flew out to Seattle, pitched Microsoft the idea of a web-based magazine, and sold them on the idea. When Kinsley announced his intention to uproot to Redmond, Washington, and create a new publication on the web, it sent shockwaves around the media landscape. This was coincident with the launch of Pathfinder and Hotwired, and so a bold print name like Kinsley joining the web revolution turned a lot of heads. There's a great Ken Aletta piece in The New Yorker from around the time that basically followed Kinsley as he first joined Microsoft and was prepping for the Slate launch. The tone of the piece is very much a mainstream media guy hanging out with these kids and their crazy computers. A lot of space in the article is spent discussing the culture clash in terms of work attire and work attitude, to say nothing of the age difference. Kinsley's direct boss at Microsoft was Russell Siegelman, formerly the head of online services who helped develop the MSN network. Siegelman was, at the time, 33, and Kinsley was, remember, 45. So there's a lot of between-the-lines hand-wringing in the article on behalf of Aletta and Kinsley about what it meant that baby boomers now had to take their orders from these Gen Xers. But the piece should probably be required reading today for anyone who is currently working in online media because it's a fly-on-the-wall record of the philosophical debates that went into the creation of online media as we know it today. Kinsley very much wanted his new publication to be serious in tone and to be taken seriously as a peer of the capital I important magazines and publications that existed in the offline world. He told his new staff that the magazine had to be lively, that he didn't think much of the existing content on the web, saying, quote, I'm too old to go whoring after 20-somethings. I'm operating on the assumption that you can give people a meal, end quote. Slate was very much supposed to be a magazine, complete with issues and publishing dates. In an early memo to staff, Kinsley wrote, quote, There should be a notional moment each week when we go to press and hit the stands, one and the same in this new medium. I would say Friday midnight. This will allow us to summarize the week and allow people to read us fresh over the weekend, end quote. Initially, in fact, there was supposed to be a weekly official issue, which you would be encouraged to print up yourself and read at your leisure, plopping it, I suppose, on your coffee table alongside the latest issue of New Yorker. There would be actual debates over whether any normal person could be asked to read any piece over 700 words on a cathode ray screen without say, eye strain or just getting bored. Some Slate staffers insisted that there should be a how-to-read-this-magazine tutorial section. Others wondered if they shouldn't try to treat each screen as a single page to minimize the monotonous scrolling issue. At one point, Kinsley argued that each new piece or article would replace an older piece, and that older piece would disappear completely. Horrifyingly enough, there was even debate about whether or not to allow hyperlinks in the articles 
for fear of sending people away to other websites. I think we can basically agree that hyperlinking is the basic building block of the web. So if you're ambivalent about that, well, thankfully, all of these issues were ironed out, with Kinsley even coming around to making Slate an always-on daily or even hourly publication. Nonetheless, at Kinsley's insistence, Slate launched with page numbers, along with a traditional table of contents, even though obviously numbering pages on the web is, I don't know, pointless. Slate's first issue was published in June of 1996. The Slate offices were primarily on the Microsoft campus in Redmond, but they also maintained a small Washington bureau. And just as with Salon, the idea from the very beginning was to launch Slate as a paywalled subscription site. Kinsley insisted that this was a basic test of both the publication and the overall medium's seriousness, saying, quote, One purpose of this whole exercise should be to help people over the conceptual hump of thinking that when they buy a magazine, they're buying the paper and the ink rather than the words and the pictures. End quote. So Slate asked people to pony up 1995 for a yearly subscription. By the end of the paywall's first year, Slate could boast 20,000 paid subscribers, which was a third of what Kinsley's former employer, the New Republic, had. But even back in the day when magazines were profitable, subscription money wasn't what kept them in the black. The reason most magazines even bother to charge subscriptions is largely to placate advertisers and prove to them that people want this magazine so badly that they're willing to pay for it, and so they're probably likely to actually read it. And so by 1997, the subscriptions were abandoned, although various variations of a premium subscription model were also experimented with. In the end, though, Being open on the web allowed Slate to attract 5 million monthly unique visitors by 2006 and thus keep advertisers on board and keep paying to have the lights on. Over the years, numerous prominent writers and voices have passed through Slate's digital pages. Slate has actually played a fairly prominent role as a sort of farm team bringing bloggers into the professional mainstream journalism world. Many prominent bloggers got their first professional paying gigs at Slate before moving on to traditional media publications or launching their own online titles. Thanks to being sheltered for so long under the Microsoft umbrella, Slate largely sat out the dot-com madness. Though, as Kinsley himself remarked on the 10th anniversary of Slate, being a division of Microsoft with a fixed budget was actually a plus. Quote, If we had spent money the way some of these other publications did during the late 90s internet bubble, Microsoft would have shut us down long ago. If these projects had guarded their pennies the way we did, they would still be publishing. End quote. Microsoft would sell Slate to the Washington Post Company in 2004, which eventually spun it out into a separately operated Slate group where it still exists today. Brief interruption here to thank our first official outside sponsor. I'm more than thrilled to be sponsored this week by Audible.com because this is a service that I actually use on a daily basis. I'm sure all of you know what audible.com is. It's where you can go to download audiobooks. But let me tell you how I use Audible. Are you familiar with the Great Courses series? The Great Courses is that catalog that maybe you've gotten in the mail. Um, They sell university-level lectures about various topics. These are actual high-level university professors lecturing on their topics of expertise. If you purchase these lectures through the learning company itself, these courses will run you 50 or even hundreds of dollars per course. That's how high in quality they are. But a lot of the great courses are also available on Audible. So with my subscription to Audible, I get 
one automatic download per month. And every month I use my download to get one of the great courses titles. This will give me sometimes 40 or 50 hours of great content every month. I, of course, tend towards history, obviously. So in the past few months, I've done, let's see, um, a course on Tudor England I'm finishing right now. I did a history of the Protestant Reformation before that. And um, a few months ago, I did a course on the great empires before Alexander the Great. If you want to go check out what great courses you could be listening to, like me every month, go to audibletrial.com forward slash internet history, all one word, and try it out for free for one month. Maybe you'll want to try one of the great courses like I've done, or maybe you want a book on internet history. Well, uh, Nick Bilton's recent history of Twitter is on there, uh, Hatching Twitter. Or maybe you're not into nonfiction at all, so you could go and say listen to Gone Girl before the Ben Affleck movie of the same name comes out this fall. Anyway, if you want to test out Audible, and if you want to support this podcast by giving us credit, again, go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash internet history and get a free audiobook. There are more than 150 titles to choose from and see why this is such a great service that I'm a huge fan of. And now, back to our story. But if we're talking about e-zines, or quasi-magazines, at the birth of the web, we can't help but talk about the actual magazine, which, more than any other single entity, seemed to be at the vanguard of the bold new world of digital media at the beginning of the internet era. And that magazine is Wired. Some revisionist historians like to propose that Wired helped launch the internet era, but in actuality, Wired predates the net revolution, or at least the web revolution. Wired was and is a magazine, first and foremost, a physical, tangible paper manifestation of the real world, Wired's philosophical ethos has always been very much a digital, cybernetic, utopian future world, but it began its life as one man's vision for a new kind of traditional magazine, a sort of Rolling Stone magazine for the 90s generation. The man with that vision was Louis Rossetto. The story of how Louis Rossetto brought Wired magazine to life is a fascinating one, probably worthy of its own episode. Born in 1949, Rosetto was actually older than most of the original PC-era pioneers. If you'll remember, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were both born in 1955. Rosetto got his master's degree in business administration from Columbia University, showing up at Columbia in 1967, right when there were the student riots against the Vietnam War and Students for a democratic society were attempting to take over campus. Rosetto has been a lifelong libertarian, and so he provocatively declared himself on campus for Nixon and briefly served as the president of the Columbia Young Republicans. But more so than most Republicans at the time, Rosetto actually absorbed the radical hippie lifestyle in all but its leftist politics. Rosetto was anti-war and flirted briefly with anarchism. The New York Times, in fact, featured a young Lewis on its cover, and inside, Lewis spouted a libertarian slogan, quote, Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what your country is doing to you, end quote. And so instead of venturing into the business world in the 1970s, Rosetto was a middlingly successful novelist, and this gave him enough money to fund a peripatetic lifestyle, traveling the world as a quasi-hippie transient slash revolution tourist. He was in Peru around the time of the Shining Path uprising, in Sri Lanka at the outbreak of the Tamil Rebellion, in Italy around the time of the Reb Brigades bombings, and in South Africa during the state of emergency. 
As a freelance journalist, he even covered the early formation of the anti-Soviet Mujahideen in Afghanistan. In the late 80s, he settled in Amsterdam with his eventual lifelong partner, Jane Metcalf. Along with Jane, Lewis began to pursue his burning dream to create a new type of magazine, one that would promote his fused libertarian hippie ethos and his growing conviction that digital technology was not only the future, it was a revolution that would fundamentally free society and bring on an unprecedented era of liberty, prosperity, and longevity. The easy elevator pitch, as I've mentioned, was that the new magazine he was thinking of would become a rolling stone for the computer generation. But that falls short of capturing Rosetto's overall philosophy, I think. Lewis believed that computers and digital technology were the tools that would finally break off humankind's shackles, culturally, politically, economically, and especially in terms of authority and government control. In a way, he was still a revolutionary, but very much an optimistic one and a nerdy one. So while still in Amsterdam, Lewis and Jane took a first stab at Lewis's dream magazine with a publication called Electric Word. When this proved to be unsuccessful, the two expatriates repatriated to the U.S. in 1991 and began to try to raise money from U.S. investors for a new magazine to be launched stateside. In media circles, Rosetto and Metcalf's struggles to land backers to launch what would become Wired magazine are legendary. Basically, everyone in the publishing industry in North America turned them down at one time or another. In part one of this chapter, I mentioned the book Burn Rate by Michael Wolff, who consulted at the time for Time Warner around the launch of Pathfinder. Early in Burn Rate, Wolf spends about a chapter telling a frankly honest story of the months he spent trying to dodge and occasionally fob off Rosetto as he went around New York messianically pitching his new magazine idea. The way Wolf describes it, most people in New York media circles considered Rosetto to be slightly better than a lunatic and his magazine idea slightly worse than madness. But undeterred, Rosetto, who seems to have had a bit of a reality distortion field, a la Steve Jobs, pulled in favors from friends and acquaintances and was eventually able to produce a prototype issue of his magazine, which Lewis wanted to call Dig It. Obviously, Dig It could also be variably pronounced as Digit. The name would eventually be changed to the one that Jane Metcalf preferred, which was Wired. Two friends that Rosetto and Metcalf pressed into service to work up their scratch issue were the now-famous designers John Plunkett and Barbara Kerr. More on them in just a second. In keeping with the Rolling Stone parallels, the Rolling Stone magazine, not the band, Rosetto and Metcalf moved out to San Francisco to launch their new magazine, where they easily fell in with the proto-digital political scene that included Stuart Brand, John Perry Barlow, Mitch Kapoor, and others that would start the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I've spoken in other episodes how the DNA of the internet is equal parts 60s hippie counterculturalism and MIT libertarianism. The politics are free market, and free software at the same time. Marshall McLuhan and Terrence McKenna in the same breath. And so, in a lot of ways, Louis Rossetto embodied this dialectic, and so would his magazine. After years of chasing down investors for their project, Louis and Jane finally hit paydirt when they attended the third-ever TED conference in February of 1992. They were able to land a $75,000 investment from Nicholas Negroponte, the legendary head of MIT's Technology Media Lab. Support from a big-name angel investor like Negroponte had a knock-on effect that enticed other investors, 
and allowed Wired to launch its first issue in January of 1993 at that year's Macworld conference. On the fifth page of the first issue, Louis Rossetto explained the mission of Wired with an essay called Why Wired? Rossetto wrote, quote, Because the digital revolution is whipping through our lives like a Bengali typhoon, while the mainstream media is still groping for the snooze button, and because the computer press is too busy churning out the latest PC info computing corporate world iteration of its ad sales formula come parts catalog to discuss the meaning or context of social changes, so profound their only parallel is probably the discovery of fire. End quote. That first issue of Wired was a smashing overnight success, especially in the digital world, such as it was at the time. On The Well, that prominent online community of the West Coast, posts about Wired dominated. And at the next TED conference, TED founder Richard Saul Werman sent a copy to every attendee. Wired made a splash because of its content, and also because of its philosophy. It was countercultural and anti-authoritarian, but also futuristic and utopian all at the same time. And it was launching into an environment that was very much primed for a digital revolution, any digital revolution. Remember, even though 1993 was the time of the information superhighway and not the web, that doesn't mean people weren't ready for the cyberpunk future that they had always been promised. And Wired definitely delivered that future in spades. The first issues dealt with topics such as digital privacy. Quote, if privacy is outlawed, only outlaws will have their privacy. End quote. Early articles and columns featured Nicholas Negroponte himself, as well as the cyberpunk writer William Gibson, who did a travelog article on Singapore called the Disneyland with the death penalty. This was soon after that famous caning case in Singapore. There were articles about cybernetics. There was a profile of the chairman of the FCC. There were technology gadget reviews, interviews with hackers, and ads from Sony, Apple, and Infinity. And there were Lewis's constant manifestos. Here's another one. Quote, You, the information rich, are the most powerful people on the planet today. You and the information technology you wield are completely transforming our lives, our families, our neighborhoods, our educations, our jobs, our governments, our world. End quote. In its first 18 months, Wired was able to achieve hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Advertisers lined up to place their brands in this publication that seemed to be at the vanguard of a new generation. And the old-school titan, Condé Nast, publisher of The New Yorker and Vanity Fair, among others, ponied up for a major follow-on investment. And Wired blew the media world away by winning a National Magazine Award for General Excellence in its very first nomination. Part of Wired's seemingly overnight success also has to be attributed to the magazine's jarring revolutionary design aesthetic, thanks to the contributions of John Plunkett and Barbara Kerr. Part of Louis Rossetto's vision of a modern magazine meant taking advantage of the advances in digital printing and software-aided design technology that was finally freeing the printed word from the legacy of the printing press that went all the way back to Gutenberg. Wired's pages were day-glow bright, colorful, jam-packed with images and text in new and innovative juxtapositions. Gone were the rigid grids of columns of text and boxed images. Text and images overlaid each other in Wired. Text spilled across the page in seeming waterfalls that some readers complained were illegible. But Plunkett and Kerr were drawing from the legacy of the zine world, 
the punk and grunge underground publications that had grown to prominence in the early 90s. By bringing this aesthetic mainstream, Wired would have an incalculable impact on the design of the early web, even if the constraints of early HTML would not allow early web developers to mimic Wired's innovations exactly. But Yahoo's jaunty purple logo, for example, was, while a far cry from Wired's loud pinks and oranges, certainly an effort to mimic the same attitude of Wired, an attitude that shouted modern and digital. Now, you'll also notice that in that survey of early Wired articles, there's no mention of the web or the internet. Again, this is because Wired launched in 1993. This was after the web was created, of course, but before Mosaic, so before the web and the internet went mainstream. Wired was certainly perfectly placed to embrace the web and piggyback off the rise of the internet to mainstream prominence. But whatever it feels like in retrospect, Wired was not actually a prophet of the internet era. It was a prophet of Louis Rossetto's vision of a digital revolution, and that digital revolution eventually became the internet. But you'll have to search with a fine-tooth comb for references to the internet in, in the entire first year of Wired's publication. Like everyone else, Wired had no premonition that the future would be delivered by the web and by the internet. Like everyone else, they were dreaming of a 500-channel and broadband world of cybernetics and information superhighways. Certainly, when the internet bubbled to the fore, they were happy to embrace it, but they definitely didn't see it coming any more than anyone else in tech had, aside from maybe Mark Andreessen. But now that the web was here... Wired was, as I've said, perfectly placed to champion the real revolution as it was actually occurring. In the October 1994 issue of Wired, there was an extensive profile of the whole nascent browser scene, with depictions of Mosaic, Spyglass, and even Spry, with quotes from people you'll remember from this very podcast, like Chris Wilson, and also a lengthy profile of Mark Andreessen, and the company that would later become Netscape. There was even a separate lengthy interview with Jim Clark. For those of us at the time who were not lucky enough to be in California, Wired suddenly became like a town crier, alerting us to the fact that something special was starting to happen in Silicon Valley. But as I've said again, even though Wired embraced the web as part and parcel of its overall philosophical worldview, that didn't necessarily mean that Louis Rossetto was interested in it. Right at the moment that his dream magazine had come to life with unparalleled success, Rossetto was slightly annoyed to discover that the very forces of the revolution Wired was covering were beginning to pull his enterprise in unexpected directions. Wired's success meant that the magazine was hiring dozens of young workers from all sorts of disciplines. And a lot of these young hires were plugged into the rising web, and so were agitating almost immediately to get Wired plugged in as well. Early efforts were made to deliver Wired via email to any who requested, but the young webheads wanted to go further. One young tech administrator told Rosetta that Wired needed to get on the web, not just cover it, saying, quote, If you're not on the web, you do not exist. End quote. Rosetta's caution about actually getting Wired plugged into the web was more about economics than philosophy, however. A lot of my source material for this chapter comes from a book called Wired, A Romance, which was written by Gary Wolfe, a longtime contributor to the magazine, and author of actually the Andreessen profile I just mentioned. He described Rosetta's position this way. According to Wolf, Rosetto was skeptical of plugging in because, for all of the enthusiasm web devotees had for this new medium, none of them seemed to be able to tell him how the web could make Wired any kind of money. Like Bill Gates before his tidal wave conversion, Rosetto insisted that the web had to pay. Quoting Wolf, Pure enthusiasm of this sort posed a challenge to Lewis's philosophy. 
His theory was that social change would come through the medium of new businesses built on new technologies, end quote. A sort of generational rift developed in the Wired offices. The young Wired staffers had bought into the idea that Wired's remit was to bring the Wired revolution forward. But why just report on the revolution when you could join it? Rosetto eventually bowed to the pressure of the webheads by hiring a young financial wizard named Andrew Anker from the firm Sterling Payout, which had been instrumental in putting together Wired's funding and financing. Hiring a numbers guy made sense because Anker's remit from Rosetto was to make sure whatever online project Wired produced would bring in revenue, meaningful revenue. So Anker wrote a business plan, got approval, and went ahead launching the new project under the rubric Wired Ventures, which was set up as a separate company under the Wired umbrella, with Andrew Anker as its first CEO. This way, Rosetto could dip Wired's toe into the web while keeping his magazine, his baby, under his control. Many of the young Wired webheads came on to join the Wired Ventures project as writers and developers. Also, the designers Kerr and Plunkett came over to bring the same visual flair to the web efforts that they had brought to the magazine. And crucially, the vice president of a well-known San Francisco advertising agency, Rick Boyce, was brought on to sell the advertising that was designed to make the web experiment pay. The experiment launched as Hotwired, on October 27th, 1994, which you'll notice was before Netscape's first browser launched, before Pathfinder, and before Salon. It really was the first true attempt to make a content-based web property that would make money on the web. Thanks to Rosetto's insistence on revenue generation, as we've mentioned in other episodes and interviews, Hotwired would have the dubious honor of launching the world's first banner ads, designed by none other than Craig Kanarick. Listen to his interview episode for more background on that. But this was before the idea of click-through rates and CPM-based ad sales. Hotwired simply sold ads for the web in the same way that it sold ads for its magazine. You bought a sponsorship on Hotwired for a fixed period of time, no matter how much traffic the website generated. You had to pay $120,000 for a year, or $30,000 for a quarter. This actually worked out to an insanely high CPM rate because, at least initially, traffic to Hotwired was not exactly in the millions. Nonetheless, Hotwired's launch was sold out to such sponsors as AT&T, MCI, Club Med, Volvo, and Zima. But part of the way that Hotwired provided value to these advertisers was by requiring each Hotwired user to register on the site and to log in before reading the content. This was not a paywall. Hotwired never charged. But you did have to identify yourself so that advertisers could at least get demographic information and target ads accordingly. So this does not exactly conform with the paywall versus advertising debate of the other sites we've looked at, but it nonetheless precipitated another generational war within the Wired and Hotwired offices. Once again, the young webheads were aghast. On the one hand, wasn't digital privacy one of the key issues Wired Magazine especially had made its name with? Giving away identifying information to advertisers seemed like a betrayal of the revolutionary principles of the magazine. Then there was the matter of how the registration wall created a barrier to the natural community of discourse that the web was seemingly built on. The webheads could see the server logs. They could run the numbers and see the vast numbers of users that made it to the hotwired front door, only to be discouraged by the simple hurdle of creating a password and a profile. How much more traffic could Hotwire's content be generating by orders of magnitude if it was freely browsable? And how could Hotwired participate in the conversation of the web if it remained aloof and segregated from it? Again, Louis Rossetto had no philosophical problem with this segregation at all. 
Remember, he wanted the web to pay, and the registration was the simplest way to do so without charging users directly. But also, his whole vision from the very beginning was that Wired would be the vanguard leading the revolution, possibly guarding and guiding the revolution. The free-for-all nature of the early web had always discomfited him. Rosetta's vision for Hotwired was a bit about bringing professionalism to the web at long last. He was quoted on the occasion of Hotwired's launch as saying, quote, The era of public access internet has come to an end, end quote. And so here we see the age-old tension between the curated web and the anarchic web of privacy versus anonymity and professionalism versus the concert of crowds being debated at the very beginning of digital media. The debates inside Wired were fierce and bitterly personal. And Louis Rossetto, the digital revolutionary, the lifelong libertarian but committed businessman, made clear to his young employees which side he had come down on. The registration wall would actually come down eventually, but it would do so for purely business reasons, not idealistic philosophical ones. Initially, Hotwired was able to charge exorbitant ad rates by trading on its brand and the assumed sophistication of its audience, as well as the the basic novelty of the new medium. But as search engines and web portals arrived on the scene, there began a downward pressure on the price of online ads. Hotwired could no longer get away with charging effective CPMs in the hundreds of dollars, The only way to compete with the search engines and their audiences of millions, as well as their seemingly limitless inventories, was to get as many eyeballs as possible to Hotwired. Hotwired would eventually go out to the open web to mingle with everyone else, and so the young webheads got their way eventually, but not by virtue of their righteous arguments. Dollar signs often carry way more arguments than principles do. One of the webheads who had been a combatant in the Great Registration Wars was a young employee named Carl Stedman. In fact, Stedman had been key in marshalling the raw traffic data from the server logs that ultimately provided the key argument that ended the registration wall. A web true believer from Minneapolis Stedman found the business realities of actually working inside the revolution, at least at Wired, to be somewhat disillusioning. He vented his frustration with this state of affairs by creating a small website within Wired's auspices, but very much behind Wired's back. Because the website that Stedman would create with his fellow hot Wired employee Joey Enough was very much conceived as the anti-wired. This website would be called Suck, and I would argue it is perhaps the most influential early media website that we have yet discussed in this chapter. The general experimentation at Hotwired and Wired Ventures meant that employees were encouraged to try their own experiments on Wired servers. Some of these personal experiments, such as Justin Hall's Links to the Underground, or Bianca's Smut Shack, actually generated way more traffic than Hotwired itself, especially in the registration wall days. So Stedman and Enough's Suck launched on Wired servers. It was just that nobody at Wired knew it. Stedman and Enough, and eventually other Wired employees, and even eventually outside freelancers who were let in on the secret, all published under pseudonyms. Stedman's pseudonym was Webster, and occasionally Dunderhead, and Enough's pseudonym was the Duke of URL. Whatever the names, the voices that set the tone were Stedman and Enough's. Gary Wolf described the duo this way, saying, quote, Where Carl is unprepossessing, almost diabolically intelligent, and a master parodist who always keeps a straight face, Joey is the opposite, a comedian, very outgoing. Even though Joey worked for Carl, whenever you saw a group of people who were laughing and being loud and unruly, 
it was always Joey in the corner of that. End quote. The original idea for Suck actually came from Enough, who took his idea for a mad magazine or a spy magazine style publication for the web to his boss. Here's Enough remembering, quote, I remember telling Carl about it and he said, yeah, we should do a mad magazine. You should do it and you should write it. You won't have to go through Gary. They won't edit your stuff. End quote. So Suck.com was launched surreptitiously on August 28th, 1995, two weeks, in fact, after the Netscape IPO. The site's tagline was, we admit it. The site looked different right away. Most early websites had some sort of a landing page, a table of content style holdover from the print paradigm to help you get oriented. But Suck just put its content right there on the front page. No need to click anywhere. And unlike the loud colors of Hotwired and other sites it influenced, Suck was just black text on white. And this is where we can begin to talk about how Suck was so influential. The simple column structure sounds like the familiar layout of a blog, doesn't it? Go to the homepage, see the latest. There's no hierarchy. If you want to see the latest stuff, just load up suck.com and there it is. The older stuff gets pushed down below the newer stuff, just like a blog. That's because Suck was always updating. Stedman and Enough tried to put up new content every single day. They were going into work every day anyway, they figured, and the web was an everyday thing for them, so they thought we should just put stuff up every day. No lip service needed to any real-world weekly issue paradigm or metaphor. The voice of Suck was pitched to people just like them, to cubicle warriors toiling away at this new web revolution. The essays and columns on Suck could be about anything. The very first was about the Kurt Cobain death conspiracy culture on the web at the time. Another early one poked fun at Mark Andreessen, or parodied the early web celebrity and blogging and podcasting godfather Dave Weiner. The posts came every day because Suck realized before anyone else, cubicle workers need a site to surf to for distraction every now and then throughout the workday. And it was an insight that Stedman had gleaned from obsessing over the hotwired server logs during the registration debate. He noticed that if you conditioned people that there might be good stuff coming out regularly, then they tended to come back regularly and refresh their pages all the time. Basically, you created a habit, an obsession. And it helped that a lot of the posts on Suck were about the cubicle warriors, about their industry, their plight on the front lines trying to make the web a reality. The tone of Suck was exasperated and jaded. Here's a quote from a typical post. The pseudonymed author Pop described his frustration with the clueless suits that he had to work for, saying, quote, They don't browse. They don't keep up. They read about the web, for Christ's sakes, in the New York Times and in the Wall Street Journal. They tell their flunkies to order up some presents and have no idea what they've done or what it should look like. They're virgins who have been told about sex and think that they have a clue. They're experts vicariously. End quote. The columns, posts, and diaries on Suck sometimes followed a regular topic, or subject matter, and the big ones were the daily essays and what was called filler, and eventually they even had full-blown features. A lot of times the posts were just gossip, industry gossip, or analysis of industry news, but they were always, always personal. There were very specific points of view coming through in every suck post, not the stenatorian reporter's tone that you would see on other websites. Even if the post was breaking a bit of news, there was always commentary, sometimes overt, but also between the lines of everything that Suck did. The tone on Suck was rude, often crude, and satirical, but at the same time glib and biting, always for a purpose. It was, in short, snarky. 
So here we have a publication that is pioneering a blog-like chronological structure, pioneering an always-on publishing schedule, focusing on gossip and insidery dish, taking a glib, satirical point of view, and choosing snark as the overarching voice. Now you can begin to see why I and so many other people think Suck was so influential. You can argue that the very structure and personality of the modern web and blogosphere was born at Suck. And let's not stop at tone and subject matter and voice. Where at Slate they were debating the very use of hyperlinks, Suck took hyperlinking to the next level. The links were part of the conversation at Suck, the commentary. A Suck post might have dozens of links, and you might not get the full story of the post until you visited all those links for context. As the author Mark Derry has said, quote, With Suck, you wouldn't get the joke until you punched through on the link. Then you found out that it set the keyword to which this new source was linked in an ironic light, end quote. And so many of the people writing for Suck, under their pseudonyms, of course, would go on to be the founding members of the eventual blogosphere. The writer Heather Haverliski was an early Suckster and would go on to become a popular salon columnist. Anna Marie Cox would become Suck's managing editor. And of course, she would take the Suck ethos almost wholesale over to Wonkette which she would found for Gawker Media some years later. Owen Thomas, who would go on to write for everyone from Valley Wag to Business Insider to Read Write Web, was an early copy editor at Suck. One of the more outlandish early Suck stunts was to send a writer to cover the Alan Keyes presidential campaign of 1996 in a very tongue-in-cheek way. If that sounds a bit like what The Daily Show does, well, Steve Bodow, suck non de plume Johnny Cash, went on to become the head writer and executive producer of The Daily Show. Suck became hugely influential among early web content producers and among those people working in media in general. Again, I would make the strong argument that the attitude, tone, and general point of view of the blogosphere certainly, but probably also the wider web media structurally, can all trace a lineage back to the innovations of Suck. Those behind Suck.com would eventually be outed by Josh Quitner at Netly News, that section of Pathfinder. But far from being offended, the higher-ups at Hotwired learned from the Suck innovations. It helped nudge Hotwired towards more of a 24-7 production schedule. And Hotwired eventually even acquired Suck.com from Stedman and Enough. Suck would have a tumultuous history over its life, getting batted around among larger corporate masters before the inevitable final post on June 8, 2001, entitled Gone Fishing. But of all the sites we've discussed in this chapter, Suck is actually one of the better preserved in terms of archives. If you go to Suck.com, you can see most of the posts and essays almost in their original form. And if you do check it out, see if you don't agree with me. Because sure, at its worst, the modern web media and the blogosphere can be a cacophony of snarky invectives, an echo chamber of aggregation and insider baseball. But at its best, modern web media is, and I'm going to use that term again, a beautiful concert of opinions and outlooks, reflecting the pulsing real-time global zeitgeist. I think we can lay all of that at the feet of sites like Slate and Salon, Hotwired and others, but especially Suck. I should probably end this chapter with a short little footnote about what happened to Wired over the coming years. For various reasons, Louis Rossetto, the self-directed vanguard of the digital revolution, never quite gelled with the revolution as it actually manifested. For various reasons, Wired missed the dot-com gravy train. It was never able to pull off an IPO, though 
It did produce its own search engine at one point, Hotbot. Condé Nast eventually purchased the magazine, but not the web properties. Wired Ventures and Hotwired were purchased by Lycos in 1999. The Wired website you see now is not actually the original Hotwired. It's web presence of the modern magazine more than anything else, which continued to flourish, of course, during the dot-com bust, especially under the tutelage of Chris Anderson, the author of the long tail theory, which would eventually do so much to drive the philosophy behind Web 2.0, and who was editor-in-chief of Wired from 2001 to 2012. If you're enjoying this podcast, there's one simple thing that you can do to help us out. If you do nothing else, just go to iTunes and rate us. One to five stars takes about two seconds. Or give us a review because the weird way that iTunes works is it's not just the number of downloads, it's also the number of ratings and reviews. As always, you can join the conversation at www.internethistorypodcast.com. Get more info, see pictures, and see my full bibliography for each episode. The show's Twitter is at NetHistoryPod, and my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening. <laughs>